So yeah, we'll talk about uh, two studies with the hopes that uh, it increases our chances of finding uh, something uh, of interest uh, to, uh, to both of us. So yes, if anything you hear today sounds exciting, just reach out to me. It would be fun to have conversations. Uh, so today's talk is on environments and problematic behaviors. I want to start the talk with uh, some images. Um, so here is uh, an image. Do, does anyone here know what we're looking at? Yes. <laughs> OK. Oh, wait. Yes. So I think uh, those of you that know, that are nodding, you know where this is going, right? This is uh, the Southern State Parkway bridge to, to Jones Beach, a beautiful beach in, in, in New York, where uh, if you look at uh, this bridge, what are you seeing about this particular architecture? You see the people who took CS347 with me, so they'll slowly turn yeah. it on. But, so compared to many other bridges you might have seen in, in your lifetime, this perhaps is quite low, right? Quite low, low on, 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 in, in its height. Uh, and um, it was done intentionally, uh, constructed intentionally to be uh, uh, this low so that it would restrict bus access uh, to this uh, beach bringing in uh, poor, generally uh, black and, and brown communities uh, to, um, to the area. So this is one example of how our environments, constructed environments, can uh, limit uh, behaviors and, uh, and um, change composition of, of, of spaces. It doesn't have to always be this insidious. So here we're looking at uh, the uh, Washington, D.C. Here we're looking at uh, the White House and, and the Capitol. And you can see that it, they are quite far away, one mile away. Uh, today's one mile, no, no big deal. They take Ubers. Back in the day, not so much, right? So here we're seeing the construction around these areas. You're also seeing this area where it used to be a swamp. So this is another example of intentional ways of constructing uh, our environments. Um, here, Capitol and White House. Uh, being built far away from each other to limit the uh, executive sort of control over, over uh, the, the legislature. Um, so these are intentional examples, but we have other examples that are not necessarily intentional. Here we're looking at the Paris uh, streets, uh, where how narrow they were, were allowing uh, sort of uh, blockades to uh, happen uh, during the revolution, uh, and, and that's in fact the thing that was uh, uh, changed afterwards. So that again is, is our environments uh, shaping our, our behaviors. Um, so I... Um, I'm interested in behaviors, but I'm interested in behaviors in the way that they are observed in, in online spaces. And I'm a little bit of a masochist, I guess. So I, I think about problematic behaviors uh, more often than, unfortunately, positive ones. Uh, so um, I think about the, the role of the environment in, in, in this context, uh, in my work in general, but also in particular in today's talk. This is what we're going to be focused on. So as I said, there are two studies that are, I'm not going to be like causally trying to tell you an argument around like how environment matters, but sort of just generally being inspired by that, by that intuition. So the first one is going to be focused on our social environments that we construct for ourselves, right? So we talked around like, Bridges and, and roads, and bridges and roads and online spaces are the connections that we have to, to other people. Uh, so here, uh, uh, in, uh, in my lab, we're currently working on network altering interventions to change people's social media repertoires. I will tell you what, what I mean by that in a minute, um, to, change those, uh, to change those environments. So I'm not going to be talking about that um, experimental uh, work today. Instead, I'm going to be talking about the work that we did uh, before that to inform uh, that particular experimental study, in that we'll look at the observational study uh, uh, we, uh, we uh, carried out to understand how uh, these environments, social environments, change organically without us inter inter intervening. Right? In the second part, uh, in a, sh a shorter version of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the two, I'm going to be sharing with you a game that we developed called Guessing. Uh, that uh, is aimed at building fun and engaging environments to deliver uh, polarization-reducing uh, interventions. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about sort of the design ideals of this game, uh, the experiment that we ran with it, and, and, and the results that came out. So let's start with the first one, where the problematic thing that we're focused on is information exposure. Misinformation. <laughs> 
misinformation exposure. Uh, okay, so uh, past work on uh, misinformation. Um, it, great, great studies. A, a lot of them are focused on individual factors, right? So um, things like selective exposure, uh, things like cognitive reflection, inattention, uh, these kinds of aspects that are leading to uh, uh, misinformation exposure. These are really important, but as I said, today we are all about the environment, that's not our focus. Environmental factors. Uh, the most commonly paid attention to and studied aspect is the algorithm, right? The algorithm of these platforms that we engage with is really the, the architecture of the world that we are engaging with. So that's it's a really sort of common aspect that, that people pay attention to. I would say early on, people would sort of assume almost without even empirical, uh, study, empirical uh, sort of findings that the algorithm is sort of the reason, the networks, the, the, the platforms are the reason that we're being exposed to uh, misinformation. Um, and there's some evidence for that, but there's also, I would say, some recent work that might perhaps get us to question some of these findings. Example could be the, the most recent Facebook and, and Instagram um, studies. So the other environment that I think is paid less attention to uh, in the way it's, it's, it's constructed is, is the environment that we build for ourselves. So this is sort of the demand factor, if you will, right? Like that, uh, uh, but demand factor can be demand for misinformation, but it might be also the way that I, I develop my own environment and how that has implications for misinformation. Uh, so a good parallel of this in media studies, in communication, is uh, what Kim uh, refers to as media repertoires. So here the idea is that we set our defaults of which news organizations we visit on a daily basis. Maybe there are home page, you know, home pages on our on our browsers, and that dictates the degree to which we get information from where. So the parallel of this in the social network world is the what I what I'm referring to as the social media repertoire. So by developing the friend, the connections that we develop, we basically shape the news feed uh, that we have. So that's the that's the sort of focus in today's uh, talk. And I'll take you back to the uh, the uh, Robert Robert Moses, uh, the the architect uh, that that developed uh, these bridges. Uh, this 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 story very briefly, uh, just to give you another anecdote here. So here uh, there is a. Um, um, a biographer, Caro, who was writing about Moses and was talking to one of uh, uh, his associates uh, and, and having these questions around, well, at the time, there was already legislation that was like blocking access for, for uh, sort of uh, black people for, uh, to, these, uh, to these beaches. And the thing that he, did sa he said was, legislation can always be changed. It's very hard to tear down a bridge once it's built up, right? So that's, that's sort of the real reality of the physical world. The thing about the online world is that it's quite easy to break down that bridge. You just unfollow, right? So the question is, uh, given that it's dynamic, given that things are not just being built up but also being t torn down, uh, our question was, can we get people to, to sort of tear down these uh, problematic connections? And, and again, the question is, is it happening on its own? So we had two, two high-level sort of sets of questions. Uh, the first one is around prevalence. So our question was, how often are misinformation spreaders unfollowed? And for that, we basically have two snapshots of the network, uh, and we're examining the degree to which these, uh, these edges are disappearing. And because we want to have this be in context, right? If I get a number, how will I know if that, that number is low or high? We also uh, wanted to have a control group. So we wanted to understand how uh, connections to misinformation spreaders uh, being broken down, is it at the same rate as, as connections to uh, non-spreaders? Non so these are all around prevalence. Uh, but um, as I said, our goal is also have to have these interventions uh, out in the real world. So we wanted to uh, have some insights as to how we should shape these interventions. So we, um, the second set of questions related, uh, uh, are, is related to here is the, the predictors. So the question is, what predicts on following a misinformation spreader. So here uh, we're sort of limited by the things that we could get at scale from the API, but it's uh, things around in initial exposure, ideology, edge characteristics, and platform activity. Those are the aspects that we are studying. Um, so related to this 
predictors. Uh, we had a set of hypotheses or uh, sort of uh, sort of deeper, uh, uh, I guess, research inquiries in mind. Uh, the first set related to uh, initial exposure, like the amount of initial exposure. How does that relate to the chances that you would unfollow someone? Um, we could we saw it. We, you know, it could go in one of two ways. So the first one uh, was what we refer to as uh, reversion hypothesis. Uh, this is sort of uh, capturing the, maybe the idea that misinformation exposure can be self-correcting. So the more you're exposed to misinformation at time t1, the more likely you are going to be to unfollow at time t2, right? So th that, uh, that's maybe the, the sort of the positive uh, uh, story, if we, if we see that. And this could happen for a number of different reasons, right? It could be high redundancy. The more misinformation followers, uh, misinformation spreaders you follow, you know, each one has sort of marginal, a smaller sort of marginal gain, right? So then it might be that they become redundant and there's maybe sort of information overload and that might be a reason why you might be uh, seeing unfollowing. Or it might be that maybe your initial choice in in following a misinformation spreader was not intentional, right? It wasn't related to sort of their, your desire to consume misinformation. And the more you have of, of them, the more you kind of get exposed to that, and you'll have sort of regression to the mean of kind of going back to your, um, your uh, sort of um, less exposed uh, uh, self. The other way this could go is uh, sort of uh, self-imposing uh, misinformation exposure being self-imposing, what we refer to as the inertia hypothesis, which is that the higher exposure at time t1 is associated with lower unfollowing at time t2, right? So this could be, again, due to many reasons. It could be that high exposure at time t1 can be a consequence of selective exposure, like you are seeking out what us, you know, researchers and fact checkers normatively decided as misinformation. So, it, and, and that, therefore, you're sort of, it's an indication that you have demand for it. And there's uh, sort of studies that would indicate that. It could also be that the more you, you follow misinformation spreaders, the more exposed you are uh, to misinformation. And there's some uh, evidence that the more exposed you are, the more you believe uh, in misinformation. So it could be, um, basically the cause of uh, believing uh, in, in misinformation, which would make it less likely that you would unfollow. So we didn't necessarily know. I, I just wanna, I wanna kind of poll people and have you all sort of pre-register uh, your, your predictions. So who thinks it's going to be the reversion hypothesis? Okay, who thinks it's going to be the inertia hypothesis? Okay, we're all very pessimistic here. Great. <laughs> all right, so uh, th that's the one set of questions that we had in mind. Uh, the other set were related to ideology. That's obviously a very commonly studied factor uh, in past work on misinformation. We hypothesize that liberals will be more likely to unfollow misinformation spreaders. This is our hypothesis three. Uh, there is some evidence, irrespective of it being misinformation, that apparently liberals just break ties more quickly. <laughs> so, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's one reason as to why we're expecting that. The other reason is that uh, most misinformation that's out there tends to have a conservative leaning, so that might be also misaligned with your, uh, with your thinking, and there might be another reason why you might be uh, more likely to unfollow. We also expected the politically extreme users to be less likely to unfollow, and there is some evidence for that as a function of past works showing demand for misinformation, right? So that is uh, evidence for increased misinformation exposure for ideologically extreme people uh, uh, in, in past work. Um, so um, that's our hypothesis four. And, um, and the, um, uh, the, the, the fifth hypothesis was that there would be an interaction with, uh, an, a negative interaction with conservatism and ideological strength in that conservative extreme people would be much less likely to unfollow compared to conservative, uh, uh, sorry, uh, extreme, extreme liberals. So uh, the interaction uh, uh, here. So those were the kind of high level questions that we had, uh, we had in mind. Um, just tell you a little bit about our data. I'm really masking a lot of the nitty gritty here, but imagine, so we have this network. First, we are focused on health misinformation in this work, and this was partly due to sort of funding reasons, but also partly due to uh, uh, we thought that it might be easier to intervene in, on mis health misinformation as opposed to, let's say, political misinformation. Uh, again, this is we're building towards our, our experimental work. 
So we identified health misinformation rumors from PolitiFact in March 2023 uh, and identified the people who shared them, uh, both to the URLs, tweets, and retweets, and so forth. We uh, filtered out uh, debunking uh, tweets. Uh, and at the end, uh, also uh, limited our attention to uh, spreaders that have less than 20,000 followers. So our goal, again, was one, to study regular users, but two, again, due to API limits uh, uh, as well. That's like those are the two sort of practical and theoretical reasons. Uh, so that gives us uh, 5.6 uh, thousand spreaders. We collected their followers, uh, gives us these edges. Those are the edges that we really want to understand. Are they, are they disappearing? And what, which ones of those are, are disappearing? So to study this predictor uh, world, we are living in only focused on these bold edges. Uh, we limited our attention to obviously the accounts that were existing in the two timestamps to make sure that it's not the node that disappears, but the edge that disappears. Uh, and we also limited our attention to the cases where we can identify the relevant covariate information, like uh, the tweet follower following count and ideology. Ideology is the most limiting one. Uh, I'll have, I'm happy to talk about um, robustness checks that we've done to see if what happens if we include the people for whom we don't have ideology, but I'll skip that here. Um, so this gives us uh, the, uh, the misinformation spreader edges. As I said, we wanted to understand how that compares to a control group. And to make that be comparable, we basically fix our analysis on the followers. So, so for the followers, we identify the alters, uh, other people that they follow uh, that don't spread misinformation. So these are the, uh, the, the dotted edges. And uh, when we are looking at this prevalence question, we're going to be comparing uh, the the bolded versus dotted edges. Uh, we couldn't do it for everyone due to uh, uh, API li limitations. There are too many followers for whom to get uh, friend information. And that's is, you know back in the day when Twitter uh, had an API uh, that, uh, that worked for, uh, for most. Uh, even in that case, uh, the network stuff was quite limited. So uh, that's why we sample 2.5 thousand active uh, followers uh, from that uh, modeling sample. Um, and, and focus on, 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 on those, on, on that group. Yeah. In more detail, the misinformation rumor the uh -huh. URLs, yeah. they, when were they classified as misinformation? Like, were they known to be misinformation at the time of sharing? Were they classified later? That is a great, uh, so yeah, we do not have that. Uh, we do not have that um, information. That is true. It might be that they don't know at the time. Uh, we did not uh, limit it to the case. Maybe it could have been like they are identified in March and then in April uh, we do that collection. So I, I think we did it both, at the, both in March. So there might be some cases where they're not debunked uh, uh, right away. Yeah, great question. Um, okay. So just to give you some sort of more intuition about our sample, I'll just give you some descriptive uh, analyses. So here we're looking at the ideology of the followers uh, in our, in our uh, sample and how uh, you know, the count of those. You can see that most followers are conservative. Uh, you can, it, most of the mass is happening here, but it's a uh, bimodal V-shape uh, 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 you know, distribution consistent with past work. Uh, but you can see that also they tend to be a lot more extreme compared to uh, the, our liberal sample. Uh, we also want to understand the sort of questions around entrenchment, like how many follow, how many misinformation spreaders a given person is, is following. So here we're looking at that distribution. You can see that it's high, uh, it's right skewed. Uh, most people, that's that's a positive finding, right? Most people follow only one misinformation spreader. So if we could intervene and break that tie, we could sort of disconnect them from this misinformation, at least the health misinformation world. Uh, but there are these people that are uh, highly entrenched, uh, and it's, it's a larger uh, a subgroup for conservatives. So conservatives are uh, following more misinformation spreaders uh, than, uh, than liberals. Yeah? Estimated by the like, well-known accounts that each person Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, this is uh, using the, 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 the uh, uh, Bayesian model by Barbara et al. Uh, uh, that basically is uh, based on, uh, starts with who you directly follow, but it's, it's basically uh, not only as a function of that, but as a function of who you follow, who also follows, and, and, and so forth. But it's, it's based on the network. Yeah. Um, and, and it's sort of well evaluated in, in past work uh, as well. So that's one of the reasons why we, we, ad we adapted that work. 
Um, so for the for these highly entrenched people, we want to understand uh, who they are. Uh, so focusing on the top 10% of followers is a function of the number of spreaders that they follow. Uh, we can see that uh, they are more extreme. This is the absolute ideology, right? So uh, you know, both a uh, high uh, positive and high negative values. Uh, so that's that, that one has a high Z score. Conservative, uh, uh, they tend to be conservative, as seen by this is liberal being negative. But there is also things that are sort of more unique to our case. For instance, we uh, again these would, we would expect from past work, but related to our work, we also see that um, they tend to be more active. Uh, but they also, their ties to misinformation spreaders are uh, more reciprocated, right? So it's, uh, they, and this, uh, if you look at the broader reciprocation uh, rate, it actually, to, to us, it was um, astonishing. It was 69% of edges to misinformation spreaders are, are reciprocated, which is quite high. Uh, and we see that it's actually driven by a few spreaders. So a, lot, a few spreaders are, Seems like maybe they are uh, engaging in maybe follow back strategies to try to keep keep people in, and unfortunately, as we will see later on in the talk, this probably is a good strategy, or it could be that they are in these sort of tight knit uh, communities uh, as well. Okay, so the results: um, how often are misinformation spreaders unfollowed, and how does that compare to unfollowing rate of non-spreaders? This is where we start seeing, you know, not I guess. <laughs> Uh, unfortunate uh, results. Uh, so here we're looking at uh, the uh, unfollowing rates, uh, and obviously we have a smaller number of spreaders in our sample, so that's why we have higher variance for that group. But uh, we can see that uh, unfollowing rate is quite uh, low. Unfollowing is really rare. So only three, roughly three percent of the edges disappeared in the uh, from March to October, uh, and unfortunately. Uh, they are stickier, those edges are stickier than uh, connections to uh, non-spreaders, right? So uh, users uh, are 31% more likely to unfollow non-misinformation spreaders than spreaders, which is it, unfortunate, like, you know, I guess an unfortunate finding here, yeah. Just a quick question about the non-spreaders. So these are the alters, right? Yeah. Um, were you following like a matching strategy there? Like how? We did not do that. We, yeah, that is, um, we, we, this is, uh, like we don't have it as a function of, um, we had a model where we were uh, controlling for, uh, uh, you know, um, the, um, their number of followers and like various characteristics that we can identify. What about uh, activity level? It, like, yeah. You're not going to get unfollowed if you don't say anything. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, absolutely. So again, we have uh, the, mo so in the model, we don't match, so we're not doing matching. Yeah. In the, uh, the sort of regression model, we do control for uh, the, the activity level. Unfortunately, that's not the model. So I'm, I'm going to only show you the, the sort of bare uh, yeah. bones comparison uh, between the two groups. Uh, so, um, but yeah, we haven't done matching. So I think that's, a, that's definitely a thing to, to, to try it out the here. The model where you, do, uh, where you do control, does it? Does it still is that they are, they are still uh, higher, uh, higher rates. Hooray. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but compare, so we also want to have another context of so comparison to past uh, studies. Uh, to, to make them com comparable, past studies are looking at like monthly unfollowing rates, so we had to uh, make, put them in the same scale. Uh, the earlier studies in 2010s, turns out people were unfollowing at higher rates. Uh, even the later studies where you have like uh, 2018 and 17, our unfollowing rates are still lower compared uh, to, to those. So, uh, so what we're finding is uh, lower unfollowing rates compared to past work. And I didn't include it here, but there's a very interesting study by Kaiser et al. where they looked at people's unfollowing intentions. So this was an experimental work where they asked people if, whether they would unfollow someone who's spreading misinformation, and they were asking questions around ideology. Um, so uh, it's, it's not apples to apples comparison because it's a like Likert scale, uh, but you know, sort of intuitively what we would expect based on that, which was sort of people's range was at like two out of five. Uh, this is quite low, right? So again, people are not, we, th these edges are, are sticky. Uh, very quickly, again, I'm not showing you the, 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 the full model, but just uh, basically we, we had this um, null model assuming what, what, what if, if uh, the, whether the person is, is a spreader or not doesn't matter. Well, this sort of random unfollowing can be sort of thought about as random sampling users to unfollow without replacement. Um, 
and which is basically can be represented by this hypergeometric uh, distribution. So the, the purple is what you would expect under this null model, and the red is what you expect in terms of the number of uh, uh, actual misinformation edges that are being uh, broken. So again, they're different. These, these people are, are uh, being uh, unfollowed much less often. Um, so now to predict the result of unfollowing. Um, so here uh, we use this robust logistic regression uh, model. Uh, we also had a, a Bayesian multi-level regression model where we had random effects for, for the spreader. Uh, they give similar results. The, the, the second model is a lot, the Bayesian model is a lot more costly, so I'm just showing you the, the robust regression, uh, logistic regression models, which happens when you have large amounts of data. You don't really generally need those fancier models. Uh, so um, the first thing that we're seeing is that reciprocity is the biggest predictor. Right? The reciprocated ties are just broken in much, much uh, less uh, uh, um, uh, frequent ways. Uh, it's more important than ideology, which is, you know, like we, we have a really high intuition about like, what, what ideology would do here. So the second important is the ideology, which supports our hypothesis three, that is, uh, liberals are more likely to, to unfollow. Um, now to the reversion versus uh, um, inertia hypothesis. At the end of the day, our measures are pretty crude because those are the ones that we had access to from, uh, from uh, the API. Uh, but according to the measures that we have access to, which is basically the number of spreaders that you follow and how much those spreaders are talking, which all would kind of uh, relate to how much you're exposed to uh, uh, misinformation, that both of those are pointing to reversion hypothesis. So the more you follow at time t1, the more you're likely to unfollow at time two for t2 for each of these uh, uh, each of these edges, which is the one positive thing that we have here. Um, the the, set, the hypothesis four we were we were expecting that ideologically extreme people to unfollow uh, less often. We did not see that. Uh, we see a barely significant and positive effect for extremity, so which is really sort of baffling. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we talk about the interactions. So we didn't hear hypothesis four, refuted, three supported, and we see uh, the support for reversion hypothesis. Yeah. I have one more detail. The marginal effect that it says probability scale, so these are not odds ratios? Of the yeah, these are converted to, to increase in, in prob uh, probability. Okay. Yeah. And so the but the raw probabilities you had said it was like 0 0.03, 0 0.04. Yeah. So that's actually a pretty big effect. The, the, the oh, absolutely. Yeah, it is a huge effect. Yeah, it's like proportionally it is. Yeah. yeah it's going from uh, 0.3 to yeah point uh, point three to point you know uh, I guess it's negative so it's going to be point one something something yes absolutely yeah is it affected by how many people the spreader is following or that or is it just any reciprocity so we did yeah we only looked at the reciprocity of the edge that's a great uh, that's a great question we didn't look at uh, just generally like as a strategy what are they doing we had quite, we had sort of ideas around like more complex network things of like you know. Tr you know, triads are closed and, and so forth. So we didn't we didn't uh, do any of these uh, things yet. But that's I think that would be a pretty easy one to to add on. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Is there a difference between an account like being unfollowed and that account possibly being like banned if it was spreading misinformation? So banned? Yeah. So we remove those because exactly because otherwise you would mistake and say oh you unfollowed mm -hmm. the person. So we are limiting our attention. So we had all these checks. Uh, of both at uh, both time periods to make sure that the accounts still existed, uh, and and uh, so it, it, we also had a uh, we, we looked at whether uh, people leaving the platform uh, varies across misinformation spreaders versus others. That's not in this work, but uh, uh, that's another in interesting inquiry. Great question. Okay, so interactions. The first one was we found this overall reversion hypothesis like evidence for that as opposed to inertia. The question is, is that really true for across uh, to, to ideology? I was going to say parties, but we really have ideology as our measure. Uh, so here we again have the marginal effect, but now separated uh, by the conservatives and liberals. So what we're finding here is that uh, reversion hypothesis holds separately for both liberals and conservatives. Both of the, like everything is above zero, right? Uh, but the effect is 1.7 times as strong for liberals. 
So liberals who are following more misinformation spreaders are a lot more likely to unfollow at time t, uh, t2. Uh, but it, it still holds, even though the effect is small for conservatives as well. So the, even the conservatives that are following a lot are, are unfollowing uh, more, more often. Now the ideological strength and, and ideology, which is a weird interaction. But again, remo let's remember, the main effect was the hypothesis four was technically refuted. We were seeing a near zero and positive average mean effect of ideological extremity on unfollowing, right? So people who are extreme were uh, un uh, unfollowing uh, more often. But as it turns out, this was masking uh, a large partisan asymmetry between the two groups. So here we're looking at the margin marginal effect of uh, extremity for conservatives and liberals separately. And now we're seeing that extreme conservatives are less likely to unfollow versus extreme liberals are a lot more likely to unfollow. So the, 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 on average, it ended up being sort of um, non-significant positive, but in, in, in practice, if you look at them separately, extreme liberals are, are uh, unfollowing while extreme conservatives are, are not. Uh, so this is uh, support for hypothesis five. We're uh, looking at the interaction. OK, so limitations, um, <laughs> many. <laughs> uh, so uh, one, our way of identifying misinformation was high precision, but presumably low recall, right? We are only looking at things that PolitiFact says are misinformation. Uh, we uh, focused on regular spreaders, and patterns might vary significantly for, uh, for you know, it, it, elite, like people who are, who are uh, extremely popular. Um, and um, what we call unfollowing also includes the, the spreader blocking the person, right? We think that's less likely, but um, uh, still a thing to, to acknowledge. Our study period is, well, weird <laughs> because Musk. <laughs> so, uh, so there was a lot happening in, in how people sort of thought about uh, uh, Twitter or X at the time. So uh, I'm clear if this would generalize to other periods. And the other unfortunate reality is that um, we might today say, oh my god, it would be so cool to get this other data. We won't be able to. So the, unfortunately, edits to the study in terms of data collection are pretty limited at this point because of uh, the API limits. Uh, but just a few concluding uh, thoughts here. Unfollowing rate is really rare, rare compared to control group, past studies, and unfollowing intentions. This discrepancy between what, what people say their intentions are versus what we are seeing in, in here, uh, I think has important implications. One is that like hypothetical studies do not generally capture what people actually do. This is not a criticism of this great work. I think it's a great work. Just to know that they capture different things, right? In the same way as like surveys and and and, and the social media perhaps capture capture different things. But also that this is encouraging for those of us that want to intervene. Like people say they want to unfollow. So the question is maybe they're missing the information uh, to act on. Uh, to, to unfollow these uh, spreaders. So this is room for uh, making people move towards their intended or uh, at least stated goals. So reciprocity was a really strong predictor. This again, I think, has implications. At least that's informing our study uh, where we kind of want to have our best shot. So if you want to have your best shot, maybe first approach trying to break ties that are not reciprocated. So that's, uh, that, that, that's one idea. Um, we found stronger evidence for reversion hypothesis as opposed to inertia, but we don't know the mechanism. And again, the mechanism matters for how you intervene, right? If it is um, sort of information re redundancy, then you might want to, in your message, r remind the person that this person is just like uh, creating information overload for you. Versus if it is like re uh, the regression to the mean, you just want to remind people, hey, by the way, you're following a misinformation spreader. So we don't know which one yet, so we can't really uh, uh, figure that out. But maybe experimental studies will get, give us that. And unfortunate thing, this is not surprising, um, extreme conservatives are more likely to consume misinformation that we already knew from past work. What our work adds here is that we are also seeing that they are less likely to severe uh, ties to spread misinformation. And they are even less likely uh, to se severe those ties, the more spreaders that they follow. So unfortunately, this is the group that is biggest concern. And this is a big challenge for those of us that want to intervene in the space. 
need the more uh, sort of most intervention, but perhaps the most resistant uh, to the intervention here. Finally, most importantly, um, thanks to collaborators, Josh, who is a fantastic uh, a doctoral student, he led this work from uh, uh, from you know basically uh, start to finish. He's doing all of the. Sorry, I'm getting updates. No, not updates. Skip, mm -hmm. skip updates. Um, uh, so okay, so uh, he did all the great stuff, all the good stuff attributable to him, all the bad stuff attributable to me and his co-advisor Eric Gilbert, <laughs> uh, and and uh, and also thanks to Mercury Project who's who's supporting this this work. Okay, so let's see. How, how much do I have? Um, Twenty. Okay, excellent. So I'll I'll go into the second. W w okay, yeah. Yeah. So on this last point, are you able to control for the ideology of the spreader? Because if most people who are spreading this information are conservative, yeah. um, you would you can imagine that liberals are more likely to unfollow those folks naturally. So I'm curious, is this really that conservatives? Yeah. are more likely to consume the service and more likely that people at either extreme yeah. are more likely, but it just happens to be that most of the accounts spreading this information are conservative. I mean, so it is true that definitely the most that are out there are conservative, and we can, we should, we can uh, like in the, in the edge characteristics, we can have like a misalignment in, in ideology as a, as a predictor. We, we did not do that yet. I think that might be a good one to add. Uh, I should say just sort of empirically looking at our, our uh, uh, the examples that we, we, we've seen. So we looked at uh, some of these um, spreaders and, and, and the misinformation that's being spread. There is, it's conservatives, but there are, there are those that are coming from the, the liberal side. And in fact, uh, the, the, I didn't go into the details of our uh, sampling strategy. If you, if you just get everything, then it, we were really oversampling from uh, part, some spreaders. And it was end, ending up that one liberal spreader was spread one thing that got really a lot of uh, attention. Uh, so we basically were, we had this like balancing uh, uh, um, um, sampling strategy that tried to keep them as balanced as possible. Uh, but we did not, and we should, we should probably add that in, in our models, yeah. I wonder mm -hmm. if there's a way to look at possibly like the, I guess almost people sort of talk about like algorithmic pipelines. If you interact with like one page, then you're more likely to be exposed to like another page. And then does that then, affect the, the amount that people are following based off of how much just the yeah. um, what just the algorithm of the website or of the social media website sort of saying that oh if it knows that people who follow these types of things yeah. are more likely to keep on interacting with their website if they continue to feed them this information this types of information or like this sort of like level is that sort of like so? So we are not, yeah, we're not accounting for sort of algorithmic effects. So like what you're being exposed to from the spreader in terms of like which things that they share you're seeing, uh, and so and I think there's an interesting question around like what are um, demand effects, what are algorithmic effects, and really these feedback loops are really, 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 really hard to account for. Uh, it, you know, both like methodologically, but also for us, since we do not have access uh, to to that information, so it's not we are, we are not we really are we don't know exactly what is like why we're just looking at in the current state how are people unfollowing. Uh, so for for us, especially for our experimental work, we can be a little bit agnostic with that because like we want to change the world as it exists today, and it might be partly due to demand, which I think, I, I would assume it's more demand than algorithmic, but it could be, it absolutely could be a combination uh, for sure. And uh, future work that can get access to that kind of uh, data uh, would be really valuable. I, unfortunately, we're going the other direction of even the simpler data that we got access to, we no longer can get access to anymore. So, but you know, yeah, good, good, good question. Okay, so now um, I'll talk about the second study uh, more briefly. So this is uh, now we're thinking about environment in a sort of a different way, which is that uh, which is uh, we we were thinking around this problem of polarization this time, sort of out party hate, and how can we sort of change that world? And there are really interesting findings from from past work in political communication as to how we do that. Our goal in this work is to deliver those things in a fun and engaging space, so people will want to do them. Right, so that's that's the main goal, and this is where we have our, our game guessing. 
I'm not going to spend much time in trying to motivate. Partisan hostility is high. It's bad. <laughs> And there are perhaps ways to fix it, right? So, um, and uh, there are really interesting studies here. One of them is this mega study that's um, sort of being at least built up at Stanford uh, with uh, you know contributions from uh, various uh, scholars um, from around the world. But uh, this mega study studied various different interventions and found that one of the most pr promising ones uh, was correcting uh, misperceptions, right? So. What do I mean by that? There are all kinds of misperceptions you might have uh, about uh, the other party. Um, the one that is uh, of attention, uh, uh, sort of our focus is, uh, is that people perceive all party supporters to be more extreme than they are, right? Uh, so uh, let's take, for an example, let's look at this question. What percentage of Republicans support requiring background checks for gun purchases at private sales or gun shows? So who here thinks that's at least 20%? Okay, at least, so we're gonna hopefully, we're gonna have some uh, hands go down over time. At least, uh, at least 50%. At least uh, 60%. Okay, well, so you, you guys are, you have, you're, you're, you're better than most. But the idea, the answer is actually it's 82%, right? So you might not imagine uh, that uh, that uh, Republicans would have such a, a position. So our goal, the idea is in the past work that you uh, correct such misperceptions. This is done in lab settings. Uh, and again, our goal is change the environment. Take people from the lab, put them in a game setting, try to deliver the same type of intervention and see what happens with that. So why through games? Well, they're easier to play than talking politics, right? Uh, that appeals to a wider audience. Um, it's, you can also design them in a way to create a wide range of interactions between, between players. And really, games create this sort of magic circle around the players where you have a different like, psychological and so, sort of social um, mindset that you get into so that you can sort of break people away from their political identities. Uh, there was a lot of thinking that went into uh, what we wanted to get out of our uh, game. Uh, so the, our design principles for this game that I'm going to show you was that we wanted no prior political knowledge requirement because we wanted to be as broadly accessible as possible. We wanted to minimize partisan cues to take people out of their sort of uh, party ID uh, 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 thinking. Cooperative games uh, so that people can uh, uh, sort of have this positive interaction uh, with someone. Uh, uh, and slow thinking, uh, we want to get people to really reflect on the information that, that was being provided as opposed to sort of fast actions. Uh, and we also included in-game messages um, uh, to, uh, to, ex to allow people to engage with, with each other in, in deep ways. So. What's the game? The game is called uh, Guessing, uh, Guessing in a Synchronized Way. Uh, this is not the most popular uh, board game, but uh, Wavelength. Has anyone here played Wavelength before? I see some nods. OK, great. So this is basically Wavelength uh, with some political stuff injected into it and done in an online world as opposed to in, in a, a, a board game setting. So pairs of players are randomly matched together and play five rounds of games. In each round, two players are shown a question. They work together as a team to provide clues and guess the answer. So that's kind of the high level thing. Um, let me show you like what the game looks like. So imagine, so here you're, you're, you are matched with uh, uh, Ali. Uh, you can see that our, our uh, sort of icons are really sort of avoid, devoid of like blues and reds and any kind of political uh, ID uh, information. You can have conversations to sort of have a friendly uh, in introduction. Uh, initial phase, guess, guess phase, you're given a question. What percent of adults have seen the movie Titanic? Uh, and you're going to make a guess. You each are separately making a guess. So you slide this uh, slider to make your guess. Uh, and uh, in the next round, one of you is going to be a clue giver. The other one is going to be the guesser. Uh, so the clue giver sees this information. It sees that the right, in, right answer is 70%, right? Now you need to give the other person just one word 
to get them to guess 70%. And you're given this target number, and you're given a scale, hot to cold. So you need to give something that says 70% cold. I must say, I'm like, I'm not a game person. <laughs> I, I was terrible, like all, in a, all of our, uh, our trials, I was the worst in, in, the, in the team uh, with, this, uh, with this kind of effort. But people can be really creative. Uh, what are events clues here? Do they say like blockbuster? Like they imply that lots of people saw it, or, or did they oh, so no, you need to give it, 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 you need to give uh, something that is in the scale of hot to cold. So because the questions uh, like change a lot, it's not about the question. The, the clue should be as a function of the scale. So it might be that maybe you're going to say lemonade, right? Like lemon. It's not it's not sun. It's not Antar Antarctica. It's like something that is like cold. But not, not super close, which is why, again, I, like, I think I, I, was str I was overthinking this game uh, more than many others. Uh, but so you might, you, you might say lemonade, and based on lemonade, now this other person is supposed to pick a, a, pick a number. The reason that we want the clue to be not about the question is that, again, it should be less about the, the political knowledge when the question is about politics, but really is like devoid of that, so you can think about something else. Uh, so if you guys, if, you, if you're, uh, guesser guesses something close enough, you, got, you get points. And then you, have, you do this like seven, five rounds, at the end of which you kind of get, get this uh, result uh, of how well you did overall, like your guesses and the actual number and you, the score that you got. So this is the game. We basically use this game in an exper experimental uh, procedure to test how we can deliver uh, misinformation, uh, sorry, mis misperception correcting interventions in this case. So the way that we did this is we pre-registered a between subjects MTurk experiment. So we're only asking people questions around their polarization or you know, our mediators and, and moderators who are interested in at the very end. So we're only looking at differences between groups. What are our groups? We had three versions. The control group where there is no political question at all. Mixed version where some of the questions are political, some are not and fully political where all of the questions are political, right? So um, we wanted to understand, you know, we, we didn't know if the mix versus fully would be better because, you know, fully provides more corrections, but there might also have more reactants. So that was our, our reason as to why we had these three groups. We had a post-game survey asking about the outcome of interest, mediators and moderators. I'm not going to talk about the mediators and moderators here. I'm just going to focus on the, the main finding. Uh, because we had our uh, um, um, power analysis before, we knew how many participants we needed. Uh, so 665 is, is what we got. Um, our political questions are coming from national representative uh, surveys like ANES and, and uh, uh, CES and GSS. Uh, and there are many questions that we could have chosen. We basically, again, went back to MTurk to try to assess uh, the size of misperception. So we want to understand how, how people get the answer wrong, especially for the odd party. And we picked the questions that had the largest misperception. Right? Uh, so that was done before. Now we found the questions for which we, uh, people we think are misunderstanding the other side. And those are the questions that we use. The main hypothesis was that players playing the mixed and fully political versions of the game will have lower out-party hostility and will show higher willingness to talk to out-party supporters com compared to control version. We did not have, again, a hypothesis comparing the mixed and fully because, again, we thought there are reasons that could go, uh, could go both ways. Uh, the results, uh, what were the results? Unfortunately, uh, there was no main, significant main effect on reducing out-party hostility, uh, but it, it did reduce out-party hostility among Democrats towards Republicans. Uh, and I'll be happy to talk to you about our analysis that suggests why we have the results that we have, if we have the time at the end. Um, and we also saw, for both groups, increased willingness to talk, to, talk about politics uh, uh, with the out-party members. Right, so for one of them it works, for the other not so much. Was there um, equal out-party hostility beforehand between the two parties? Right, uh, so, <laughs> the great question. So it was actually 
I believe, so this, is, this kind of also goes back to why we see these differences. There are two reasons why we see these differences. Uh, I'll quickly say, our Republicans are weird. <laughs> uh, so in that, they are, if you look at uh, the hostility that you, that you see in our group versus other studies that are looking at uh, effective polarization, it's lower. And also they are, uh, their uh, misunderstandings of the other side are also, it goes the other way. <laughs> that is like they sometimes think that the Democrats are less, uh, uh, less uh, liberal than liber extreme, extreme than they are. Uh, and they moved in different ways. So, and, and this is the thing that we actually have seen. Online politics exactly. Yeah. So that's uh, absolutely. So that's one of the reasons why I think we are seeing the difference. The other thing is again our initial MTurk experiment. We chose the uh, the questions that had the largest misperception, but it turns out again we chose for Democrats questions where Republicans thought they were less extreme than they were. So we were in the. In our intervention, we were telling people, no, no, actually, Democrats are you know, more extreme than you think they are. So that's, I think, part of we, that, you know, in, in retrospect, we did not imagine that this would be the case. So we, uh, that's you know, uh, future work, I guess. Um, but anyway, so the, the thing that was, you know, I'm an high school information person. So it's the thing that we, I think we can uh, contribute here is Political communication scholars are doing all these great work to identify like theoretical reasons as to why we delivered the things that we do. Our thing was like we need to make this fun. <laughs> so, uh, so the the answer I guess here is that uh, people did indeed find uh, find that uh, to be fun. So we think that once we sort of figure out these uh, issues, it could be an encouraging way to to deliver the uh, the interventions. Okay, so then here again, the idea was to change an environment and uh, to make things fun uh, uh, so that they can scale. The asymmetry is concerning. Again, I'm happy to talk more about uh, the reasons as to why we have uh, seen that. The, the game is there. You know, if you want to play with your friends, just make sure that you have at least two people. Otherwise, you're going to be waiting for, <laughs> for a while to be matched. Uh, thanks to... Ashran, who was a fantastic doctoral student and now is a fantastic uh, assistant professor at UT Austin. He led this project start to finish. Just really should get all the credit, along with our undergraduate students who were, who were so helpful in, in helping us uh, sort of design this game and test it and so forth. And again, uh, the, this time the uh, uh, co-advisor being uh, Paul Resnick. So yeah, that's all I have. Um, thank you. All right, we got a few minutes for discussion and questions. I'm just curious, how did, how did this idea, the get safe game idea, like appear? Like, why pick a game? Like, what was the motivation? I think this yeah. is a super cool project. Yeah. Really. Just curious. Yeah. Um, I don't know how it came about. But so the, the motivation is, is like sort of what I said, which is that um, there is like reactance when you're trying to deliver all of these interventions, try to change people's uh, attitudes and, and, and behaviors. So we were trying to think about like what environments would make it such that those kinds of things are less likely to happen. So that's one thing that is like they will, uh, there won't be as much of a, of a reaction, a negative reaction, but also again, things that just, people will want to do. So as you're like, because you were like, you know, listening all of this like political communication work on like, you know, media literacy and like, like get people to talk to each other. And like, how do we, how do, how do we do that, <laughs> right? So how do we make it such that I'm not going to pay you money to, for you to come to the lab for you to do that? So that it's a thing that people want to do repeatedly and, 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 and learn from. So, so that was the main goal of the, the game itself, um, like or game, using games, period. I do think that maybe we started with a harder than necessary uh, game. Like we made it, again, we had like, oh, people should collaborate, you know, cooperate and all of these things. It, there were like simpler versions where you can have um, people just play games on their own for them to correct misperceptions and like gamify this, uh, this uh, problem. Uh, and now we're sort of in the process of trying to figure that out, especially Ashwin, who is, uh, you know, again, is leading this, this uh, effort. And I'm hoping that he's going to have the sort of breadth of, of games that we're going to have. But yeah, the idea is really sort of like gamify things and, and people will want to do them. So 
So there's also a picture of like a chat thing on yeah. the side. Did you look into like what, how people were communicating on that chat? We like, did. Uh, I mean, it was more like qualitative as opposed to, so, by the way, the chat is disabled during the guessing part because you don't want people to be giving each other extra information. Okay. It's only sort of in the beginning, like, hi, and it's more, like, you're sort of seeing more like positive things, so like, oh man, this is great, you know, cool, we, you know, I, I thought this was fun, or, so it's, and, and I think that we did not um, try to design over design that, but we have a lot of work and uh, sort of HCR work that would say like once you have a, put a chat thing there, it could go in all kinds of ways, right? Could, people could be like nasty to each other, but because it's a cooperative game, we were expecting there not to be as many sort of issues there, but just like allowing people to make this be more sort of fun and interactive. So that was our, our, our goal. Uh, yeah, I think just, just qualitative analysis is what we have there, but uh, as you have like a, a whole portfolio of games, in some games, chat can go in wrong ways. Like if you're like, trying to get you know, Democrats and Republicans to talk to each other it, during a game, here we didn't have that, uh, then you might think about like how do I design uh, that, that chat function to make sure that it doesn't, it doesn't go sideways. Um, was there any sort of effect from like who was paired in the game? Like, I don't know if you ever looked to be like, oh, this was like a Democrat Democrat matching or anything. Because I, I would assume that you'd be thinking that that wouldn't have effect because it's just about like kind of correcting the assumptions yeah. in a masked way. Yeah. But like, did you look into that and was there? So that we definitely didn't power for that. So it was like it wasn't as uh, important. We were not expecting to see a, an effect there. I'm trying to think if we have, so the, there were a thousand <laughs> different analyses we run here. Uh, I don't know if we looked into this and uh, um, I actually, I don't remember. I think, I expect there not to be an effect because we tried to remove as, as, as much as uh, uh, possible and the clues are also not like political clues but this like the scale that we're talking about. Uh, um, so we were more about like whose perceptions are being corrected. But you know, we, can, we should start, certainly look, look into that and make sure that that intuition is right. So this one might be better asked over beer, but yeah. I'm curious, you start with this vision of fairly substantial top-down design yeah. that, to shape behavior, like, yeah. you know, um, the Langdon Winner style, yeah. like, you know, the can't get under the bridge, or like, we put these things a mile away. Yeah. And plat, you know, I, I would describe most platforms have been pr shied pretty far away from anything yeah. nearly quite so yeah, yeah, um, yeah. present. It's, it's like, you know, in order to go follow this person, you need to go run a mile. Yeah. Or something like that. Anything that would put like substantial friction. Yeah. I'm curious, like, given the framing, yeah. like, like how far would you go yeah. if you were actually trying to do this sort of social design here? Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a great so great question that which is I think it maybe I think I have like different answers for the first study versus the second study. In the second study, we are doing this. You build the bridge, and the bridge is like designed to to shape behavior. Like we are going to have these games with certain sort of values in mind, and people are still going to co-opt them and change them because that's what people do with with uh, with platforms. But there, we have like really sort of top down for the uh, for the unfollowing, uh, uh, you know, um, study. The question is like, how do we like should is it the platforms that should you know deliver that intervention, or is it you know us in a sort of a smaller a smaller scale? So I guess maybe in that case, I, I would imagine that there would be more reactance when it's at the platform level, and also we are really like there is all kinds of values for connections that are beyond uh, you know uh, the fact that whether whether somebody's sharing misinformation. So um, I guess there. Uh, what I would imagine, what we we should be doing is perhaps not as as top down as as uh, uh, you know, in this in this other other case. So, yeah, I don't. I I feel like I'm, I I myself am not <laughs> satisfied with that answer. I guess all I'm saying is maybe like it 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 uh, it depends. But when it comes to us sort of researchers developing these games, having those values embedded in the in the games that we're constructing, seems 
okay to me, as long as you're not like uh, trying to deceive people, yeah. uh, uh, which you know we're um, not at the end. So hopefully this will like if it's a portfolio of, of games that are out there, people will know it for what it is. Uh, so that which might limit its its impact, uh, but you know, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And let's thank our speaker one more time.